bro. So I love how you, how, where this is going because, you know, you and I have been looking at this topic for, I don't know, three years or so, roughly that, maybe a little bit longer. And I had never come across Revelation 12, but as we were preparing for this episode, I, I, it came to me. I believe God revealed it to me. And, and, and I just want to say this is our manja. This is the manja. Yeah, the manja, Fiji. manja. It's time to eat. It's time to eat. We're talking about you cannot, birth happens in creation revealed to us through the feminine aspect of God. We agree to that, right? Women give birth here on earth. And we're making the, the point that perhaps being born again as a Christian or given a new resurrected body of spirit and water, perhaps that also would come from the feminine aspect of God. Let's call it the Holy Spirit that does the saving and the cleaning and the baptizing and the rebirth. Let's just say that that's what it is. We talked about the crowns pointing to wisdom and how she wears a crown and these rubies. We talked about how as soon as Jesus was baptized, that's when he fully had wisdom or fully had the Holy Spirit and immediately went into the wilderness to be tempted. So in that context, I want to read to you just a couple verses from Revelation 12. Disclaimer, I understand Revelation is very deep, allegorical in a lot of ways, and everybody thinks that they have a, under, a secret understanding of Revelation. So I want to make it clear that's not what I'm trying to say here. And there is a, another popular theology that links these verses back to Genesis 37, I believe. So there is a, a good theological counter to what I'm saying. But in the context of this episode, wisdom being the Holy Spirit, I came across this, and I want to just read it to you, and let's unpack it. So this is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. It says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven di diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God in which she would be nourished for 1,260 days. There's a lot going on there, but I want to try to attempt to understand who this pregnant woman is in heaven and what this is a picture of. I submit to you for your consideration that the woman is wisdom or the Holy Spirit, who is about to give birth to the firstborn of all creation, as Paul would say it, one who would be a male child, a king, who would rule the nations with rod and iron, which, by the way, is in Psalm 2. We know and we identify that firstborn king to be Jesus. Paul talks about in Romans 8, we are part of a greater family. What I would submit to you is that this woman with a crown on her head is wisdom in heaven, about to give birth to Jesus Christ, and the enemy was waiting there to try to devour him, let's say enter into the wilderness and try to devour him. But the father snatched this baby up and sat him on the right-hand side of his throne so that he would not be devoured and that this woman could continue in her birth pangs, giving birth to all the Christians that would follow her firstborn king, Jesus Christ. And this is a picture of what was going on in heaven and what is going on in heaven, the war between good and evil. And this woman is in fact emblematic or symbolic of wisdom or the Holy Spirit in heaven. What do you oh, think about that, brother? That was awesome. And I've never put that together too. So that was definitely a revelation. Great, great explanation there. It makes sense. And especially with this episode, um, there's one thing I did want to say though. So, um, we, you know, Paul talks about it, about grieving the spirit. We don't want to grieve the spirit, right? You know, we've heard that, right? Um, what, what if that's birth pain, guys? So that word, lupeo, 3076, um, 
it's it's like deep uh, grief to experience deep emotional pain, sadness, severe sorrow, very intense. So that's the word when Paul says, you know, we're grieving the spirit. It's, you know, it, we, we've talked about, you know, different books. Masoretic is the, you know, the majority book, but uh, there's, there's a, the Septuagint out there, which is the Greek Old Testament, basically. It's, it's the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, so if you look at that word, lupeo, you know, there wasn't two different Greeks. You can work, you can look at that word in the Old Testament, in this Septuagint. And it was used in Genesis 3.16 um, for the pain of childbirth. That, that's what that word is. So when you're trying to say, you know, please don't grieve the Holy Spirit, when you're using that verse, maybe link it to a childbirth and to, you don't want to mm. cause the pain to, mm. <laughs> to, mm. to the mother there. Um, mm. Yeah. So I thought that was awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks for that manja. Here, here's my manja to end this. Um, so, you know, we know the fruits of the spirit. Everybody's, oh, fruits of the spirit, fruits of the spirit. What if we can link that to wisdom? Galatians, I'm, I'm going to quote the Wyclef version. Most versions have nine fruits of the spirit. I'm quoting Wyclef because it has 12, and I'll show you why. So um, Galatians 5, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, self-control, modesty, chastity, against such there is no law. Revelation 22 says, and he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits. Again, so I just want to highlight 12 fruits. Galatians 5 and the white class has 12. Revelation has 12. Mm. And then I want to focus on this tree of life. Before I do that, do you want anything to say there now? No, I love it, man. I okay. love it. Please keep going. So Proverbs 3.18, you know, it's all about wisdom. Proverbs 3.18, she wisdom is a tree of life to those taking hold of her, and blessed are all who retain her. I would say it's a blessing when you have the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is the tree of life. Revelation says the tree of life will have 12 fruits in, in the New Jerusalem, in heaven. Amazing. Okay, so we talked about that. We talked about this. Can we link wisdom with the fruits of the Spirit? To me, this this really kind of solidifies this. Mm-hmm. So Sirach 116, to fear the Lord is fullness of wisdom and fills men with her fruits. So fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom in Proverbs. Sirach says the fear of the Lord is the fullness of wisdom, fills men with her fruits. Wisdom is a spirit. She has fruits. Proverbs 8, 19, my wisdom, my fruit, this is wisdom speaking, my fruit is better than gold. Yeah, than fine gold. And my revenue than choice silver. Again, this is Proverbs. This is, this is canon. Speaking of wisdom, we all know Proverbs 8 is about wisdom. She has fruit, and it's better than gold. <laughs> so that's, you know, fruits of the Spirit. James, James, I'm going to wrap it up here, James. We all know this. James 3 talks about wisdom. There's heavenly wisdom. On earth as it is in heaven, there's earthly wisdom. So James 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to in- be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Before this, 14 and 15, it says the wisdom from below, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, don't boast, don't lie. Going back to our intro and what bromology is really about, Dan shared about 1 Corinthians, about coming from milk to meat, and he described it, and it's true, that you know you can be on milk but have horrible fruits. <laughs> you can be you know um, jealous and, and bicker and divide. That's the wisdom from this world. Don't you want the, the wisdom, the Holy Spirit from above? Mm. Well, and doesn't Jesus say you'll know them by their fruit? Amen. Amen. Um, what other way to know that the Spirit dwells within you than to bear fruit? Amen. So this is, for me, it helps It helps my theology a ton to understand that there is a feminine aspect of God. It impacts the way that I see my sisters of the faith. It impacts the way I think we can do ministry together. If we see the Trinity as male dominated, male father, male Holy Spirit, male son, that is in a love relationship with each other, and creation spilled out as a result of that overflowing love, then God decided, now let me add this feminine thing to creation that really isn't represented by my image and my likeness. That is a way to believe that. But I, for me, a way that seems to make a lot more logical sense and really softens my heart in a lot of ways 
is to understand that there was a feminine aspect of the relationship within the Trinity before creation. And her name is Sophia in the Greek, if you want. Um, just to be clear, I don't pray to the Holy Spirit. No. I still pray to the Father. Absolutely. And I pray through the Son, asking for the Holy Spirit. Amen. To it's a gift. It. It's a gift, right. So and, I don't want to get weird about this. It's yeah. not like, you know, you start praying to the Holy Spirit yeah. because you identify her. But doesn't it make a lot more sense in your view of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit part of the Trinity being a third person, right? You know Jesus right. is a person. It's not that hard to see that the Father is a person. But it's always been weird to see how the Holy Spirit's a person. And this kind of really helps make a lot more sense to that. That it, she she is a person, and we just we hope that this study elevates women. It it you can search it out. There's so there's so much on this topic. We just gave you a percentage. Um, I just want to say that if if you take one thing from this and you want to study out, it's holy family in heaven. And so there's a reason why the family is so important to Christ and and God. And on here, he tells us what what a family is. Why would it be different up there? Um, we just pray that we humbly submitted this to you. Um, you know, Jesus talks about, he will not leave us orphans. You know, take care of your orphans and widows is peppered throughout the whole Bible. Why? Why? It's because if you're an orphan, you have no parents. And if you're a widow, you're missing your spouse. And yeah. I think it's because we we are meant to be a cod. We are meant to be a family. Holy family in heaven. Amen. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Amen.